Thank you so much, David, for inviting me to be part of this great program this evening. And if you can give me just one more second, I wanna share some photographs with everybody. Okay, I hope you're all seeing that picture of a plow and in the background are the buildings of the historic effort of Cloister. Yes, we are. Okay, great, we're ready to go then. So I'm gonna start with uh, one of Ephrata's residents named Stephen Koch. Uh, he was living in Germantown, just outside Philadelphia in 1739, when he decided he was gonna move to Ephrata. He was a spiritual person and this just uh, seemed to fit his uh, needs at Ephrata. He wrote a letter to a friend of his that year telling him about where he was going to live in the back country of Pennsylvania, way out in Lancaster County. And he described the place and the people. And he talked about the people and he said, quote, whatever they sow and plant in the fields, they till by hoeing. Well, whatever they sow and plant, that certainly covers a wide range of things. And so that's exactly what we're going to do tonight. In just a few moments, we're going to cover a wide wrath, a swath of material discussing the agriculture and horticulture at the historic Ephrata community. Now, agriculture and horticulture in this village is just part of the story. The village that Stephen Koch came to live in in 1739 had only been in existence for about six years at the time he arrived. Some of these large buildings you see in this illustration hadn't even yet been built but they would come and more like them would be on the site at its peak in the mid 18th century. This religious community was a, a German Protestant settlement with a, a reputation that stretched back to Europe because of the distinctive lifestyle followed by the members in the community. It was a monastic lifestyle and because of that people from outside Ephrata labeled this place a cloister, a word that no one within the congregation actually used to describe their home. They called it simply Ephrata, a name chosen by the founder, Conrad Beisel. Beisel was a German immigrant and a mystic. He had traveled in Europe and encountered various religious communities. He did the same here in early America until he decided he would pick and choose from what he's heard mix him with his own ideas and create his own unique theology. And he was going to follow that theology as a hermit out in the wilderness. But although he was a very hermit type person, he was also a very charismatic type person. And he soon attracted followers who built the community. Beisel's theology said that God was coming to earth very soon. Life on earth should be spent getting ready to meet God. He believed that in order to prepare for heaven, you needed to sacrifice all worldly distractions of life on earth. And that included marriage. He said, if you're thinking about your husband, or your wife or your children, you're not thinking about God all the time. So he encouraged celibacy, he also felt that Saturday was the proper day for worship and he required adult baptism to enter the community. The peak of this community was really between about 1740 and 1755. It was at that period, the community had about 40 celibate sisters and about 40 celibate brothers. They followed this very distinctive monastic lifestyle wearing white robes to show they all belong to the same family, following a very disciplined daily schedule that included, out, included hours for work and hours for prayer. Beisel felt you wouldn't need to eat once you get to heaven and this is the time to get ready. So practice, just one meal served each day at six in the evening, primarily a vegetarian diet. He also felt that uh, God may return at midnight. So every midnight there needs to be a worship service. If that comes in the middle of sleep, 
there's only six hours of sleep, but it's divided in half into two, three hour periods. And those times are spent on a wooden bench as a bed and a block of wood for a pillow. Beisel says the devil could enter your mind through dreams and you certainly don't want that. So the wooden block and pillow will keep the devil away. Now, while the celibate members tried to be sufficient in their self-sufficient in their community, they did rely on the support of a married congregation. Those married members, 200, 220 or so husbands, wives, and children in that same peak period, they lived on their own private farms in the neighborhood, and they had no restrictions on their life. They did attend the Saturday worship with the celibates, but they had no distinctive dress, no rules about food or sleep or anything other than their neighbors and anything different from their neighbors. And so that is the core of the effort of community in the 18th century. Now, the community became known for its very distinctive Germanic architecture, the Germanic illuminated manuscripts, printing, including this book, the largest book published in America prior to the Revolutionary War, 1500 page volume, and music. They composed over a thousand pieces of original music, including works by some of the first female composers here in America. At the peak of the community in the 1740s and 50s, the community owned about 250 acres of land. What you're seeing here is a land draft for the property drawn in 1815. I'm gonna color in just a little bit here. The winding thing you see here is the Cocalico Creek. Uh, can you see my cursor sliding around there? Good, okay. So all of the colored area is roughly the 250 acres the community owned. By the time that this map was drawn in 1815, they had lost about 120 acres, largely due to some internal squabbles, shall we say, between members. Uh, so what this map is really showing us is about 120 acres. And of the total land they owned, they had only cleared between 70 and 80 acres. Today, the remaining historic site comprises 28 acres, that green spot I've just added there. Now, let me read you a description of this community by a visitor from 1759. He says, the situation of their town is judiciously chosen, being on the declivity of a little hill which faces the Southeast and screens them from the piercing North winds in the winter. The town is built in the form of a triangle with a large orchard in the middle. Along the outside are planted thick rows of apple, peach, and cherry trees, which bear great quantities of fruit. Looking at this map, this line right along the edge of our property is really sort of the crest of that hill that this visitor describes. And the green property lies along the slope down to the base of the hill in that somewhat uh, uh, easterly direction. This remaining portion down below, this almost a kind of an odd wishbone shaped thing, uh, that's about 80 acres. That was part of the property until the early 20th century. And it, from the crest of the hill, is a long, gentle, almost flat slope down to this lower portion where the community mills were located. That roughly 80 acres became the fields that were operated by the community for their own support. Now, we sometimes, folks will ask us, how do we know what we know about things? Lots of effort is piecework and educated guesswork. They were not good record keepers. We do have wills and inventories of both some celibate members and married members. We have personal letters and account books from some of the married folks. We have a lot of descriptions by visitors to the community. We have Germanic customs that this community followed. And we also have a bit of that theology that Beisel developed. 
little bits and pieces of clues exist in all of this to tell us something about agriculture within the community. Starting with theology and this document, it's Conrad Beisel's personal music book. And in his music book, he outlines his own system for composition of music. He also prescribes a diet for the singers. He says singers are not to have butter, eggs, milk, honey, cheese, or meat of any kind. That tells us that, at least we think it tells us, that if you're not a singer, you probably can have those things. And other bits of clues can reinforce that idea. But it also tells us that things like vegetables, fruits, as we've already heard mention of peach trees and cherry trees, those are some of the crops that are being raised within the community. A visitor in 1753 eats the evening meal with the brothers. He describes the evening meal that night as barley boiled in milk, pumpkin mush with crusts of bread broken into it, bread, sort of a cottage cheese type dish, and for himself they gave him butter. Remember I said this is primarily a vegetarian diet, but again, look at what kind of crops we're seeing right in front of us here. Wheat or barley or some sort of grain, pumpkins, uh, you know, the, the cheese uh, that tells us a little bit of dairying going on. And in fact, when we look at all the records, this is kind of a sampling of things that are specifically mentioned in records as crops being raised and consumed in the diet at Ephrata. All those grains right in the top row, rye, oats, spelt, barley, buckwheat, lentils. Although one of the married members who writes about his farming experiences often mentions that they do have a little bit of wheat bread, but most of the wheat they sell to the English in Philadelphia. Whole row of fruits there in the middle. Uh, apples, peaches, cherries, grapes. Although one visitor says the grapes are not in large quantity at Ephrata. Uh, and then those great vegetables coming from the gardens, probably tended by the sisters. Cabbages, potatoes, beans, onions, peas, turnips. Peter Miller, the second leader of the community, specifically tells the visitors they have roots and greens. I don't know specifically what he means, but I think we're thinking about think, turnips and, and uh, cabbages and the like. So it's the diet that gives us clues about the, the agriculture at Ephrata. One visitor in 1753 describes the work of the brothers this way. He says, the business of the brothers outside the house is to work the fields, meadows, and woods, also at their mill the greater part of them seem to be brought up in agricultural labors. So yes, we know they're farming. The brothers are farming. Are they using any specific techniques? That we don't know. The best we can do is make some guesses based on German traditions and early Pennsylvania German traditions. An artifact that testifies to their agricultural labors is a stable, a log stable. And this building was standing on the property until the early 20th century. This is an 1890 photo. We have another from about 1918 or so, uh, which is probably about one of the last years it was standing. But the building has been reconstructed so that we still have their presence of agriculture in the form of this stable building. And what might have been inside the stable? Well, we know from tax records the kind of animals that were on the property. There's usually three or four horses. There's usually four to six cows. And the other item that's animal mentioned in local tax records is sheep. But for Ephrata, sheep never appear. We know they wore wool. So where were they getting that wool? Perhaps it was a contribution of the married members. It's also possible they bought cloth. The white habits that they wore took about 10 yards of fabric to make one habit. We've got 80 celibates, we need 800 yards of fabric. 
They've got two sets of clothing, a nice clean set for Saturday worship, a dirty set for the rest of the week. Now we need 1600 yards of fabric, probably more than they could con cre create themselves. So they may have been buying fabric. One other artifact which survives from the probably 18th century is this plow, a very, very early plow that is original to the site. Uh, and uh, it's one of the really significant agricultural artifacts surviving from 18th century Ephrata. There was also one major non-food crop grown in Ephrata, and that's flax. Flax, of course, is the source for fiber to make linen, but the flax seeds are also equally important. Flax seeds, if you've never seen one in person, think of a sesame seed on your hamburger bun. They're just about that same size. Well, one of the married members reports taking 15 bushels of those seeds to Philadelphia to be sold to Ireland. And in, flax, in fact, flax seed was a major export crop of colonial Pennsylvania. But the brothers at Ephrata also liked the flax seeds because they had an oil mill where they could extract the linseed oil. They had both an oil mill and a grist mill for making flour. The sisters also took care of the gardens and grew herbs for medicine. One little interesting thing about medicine and herbs at Ephrata is that in 1749, Benjamin Franklin wanted to print his own edition of a very popular medical book called Every Man His Own Doctor. But Franklin knew there were lots of German customers in the back country of Pennsylvania. So he came to Ephrata and had one of the married, or one of the celibate members, Peter Miller, translate the entire book into German for him for publication. And he acknowledges Miller on the cover page. It says PM down below there. Now, not only was there crops of physical form and nutritious form grown, there was a whole second set of crop at Ephrata, and this is where horticulture sort of comes in. This is a bit of imaginary and inspirational horticulture. I'm showing you two illustrations from Conrad Beisel's personal music book. Those you could probably recognize as flowers. In fact, that one has got some bumblebees sitting right in the top of it. But Ephrata takes the idea of a garden, perhaps a garden of Eden or the garden of heaven and turns it into extremely creative flowers. These also come from Conrad Beisel's music book. And you begin to get this sense of some sort of plant growing out of this vase here, but not a plant I've ever seen and they get even more exotic. This is part of a manuscript created in 1750. This particular page is referred to as the Great Effort of Lily. And just the next page in the manuscript contains this set of three beautiful flowers. So far, you've only seen black and white flowers, but just wait. There are gardens of beautifully colored and illustrated flowers, flowers the kind again, that don't grow here on earth, but certainly grow in some spiritual world. And the creation of these beautiful flowers was not just the idea of creating a pretty picture, but it was a spiritual discipline, a focus, a way to get your mind geared to think about God. I often tell visiting school children, I can imagine a sister working on a picture like this and saying, this pen stroke represents what Sister Anastasia did for me. This pen stroke is what Brother Yabez did for me. The, these flowers even show up in very small form on the edges of letters. And I'll tell you that this particular letter is about the size of a postage stamp in real life. Effort is also a place of legend and I have to leave you with a legend the legend that the brothers pulled their own plows. This illustration was done in 1880 for a magazine article, but the idea of this idea that the brothers pulled their own plows, which we don't think is actually true, they did 
do some their own labor, but and at one point they did pull their own carts, but probably not their own plows. This illustration idea became so captivating with the artist Henry Rankin Poor that although he did this illustration in 1880 for a magazine article, 14 years later he returned to the subject and painted this beautiful, enormous photograph with the same title, The Brothers Pulling the Plow. It's one of the many legends that are part of Ephrata's long and complicated history. And I appreciate the chance to share just a little, just a little snippet of some agricultural heritage with you this evening. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, um, a question and the way yeah. you described um, how you know what you know and the resources is that the two populations, the householders married and the celibates, plus the fact that you've got a very specific amount of land defined for fields, 80 acres, are the householders not only married and living life uh, as they desire, are they farming their own land or? Are yes. Okay. okay. Yes, yes. So. You know, one of the families we know a lot about, Dietrich Faunestock, the one who talks about raising 15 bushels of flax seeds, he actually owns 280 acres. Okay. And the best I can tell, he's got the greater portion of that cleared of forest and, and turned into fields. He also gives descriptions of uh, taking uh, 50 bushels of wheat to Philadelphia in his wagon. He can only accommodate 50 bushels of wheat in his wagon to Philadelphia, which he says can be turned into 2,000 pounds of flour. Okay. And then finally, with the, the land that you define within the cloister of the 80 acres, uh, with the records you have, then is it that land and only that land that's uh, being used and managed by the celibate community? They've got the entire 250 acres. Right. Okay. So they have this large amount of woodland, which is probably providing them timber for building and fuel for their many stoves they're operating. Um, and the, the from uh, you know, I'm saying 80 acres, that's kind of a, a rough number. The numbers fluctuate every year in the tax records as to how much cleared land they have, but it sort of averages around 80 acres. Okay, great. Well, again, Michael, and for those of you joining us, um, because you may know or may be connected to one site or the other, in the chat, I've posted the links to the primary, to the websites of each of our, of, of our presenters, Ephrata Cloister, Old Economy Village, and of course, um, as the host, Landis Valley. So we switch from Ephrata Cloister and uh, the heart of the 18th century. We move to the far west side of Pennsylvania to an area I'm gonna say is northwest of, of uh, the present day city of uh, Pittsburgh. And um, we switch also from uh, the heart of the 18th century to uh, more of uh, the 19th century. So uh, with that, uh, Sarah and Michael, take it away. All right, well, uh, good <laughs> Um, I'm David Miller, the museum educator here at Old Economy Village, and we are located north of Pittsburgh. We're about 18 miles north on the Ohio River in Beaver County in the town of Ambridge. Sarah, if you'd advance the slide, please. Can you see that okay? Can you advance to the okay. Yep. All right. All right. So um, our story is uh, the story of the Harmony Society. The founder of the Harmony Society was George Rapp. He was born in southwestern Germany in 1757. Uh, by training, George was a weaver and also a vintner uh, working in the vineyards. And he got sick and he spent a lot of time reading the Bible and decided that he was called to be a prophet and a pastor. 
So he started uh, preaching in southwestern Germany. He did not really agree with uh, some of the things that the Lutheran church was teaching. And um, he had quite a following. It's estimated that upwards of 10,000 people would listen to, to George uh, preach in southwestern Germany. Uh, he went to jail for a very brief period of time for his beliefs. And when he got out of jail, he thought maybe it's time to consider moving to the United States. So in 1803, George and um, a handful of um, family and his followers came to the United States to try to find land. And they were able to purchase land in what is now Butler County. And in uh, 1804, they established the town of Harmony. So in 1804 and 1805, uh, his followers start coming over to the United States. And they live in the town of Harmony until 1814. And then they decide that they want to move west. So they move to Indiana Territory and they settle along the Wabash River and they establish a second town, which they also called Harmony. Today it's known as New Harmony. And they live there from 1814 until 1824. Next slide, Sarah. Then in 1824, they decided to come back to Pennsylvania. So uh, they, they moved back and they decided to settle in um, what is now Beaver County. Uh, they purchased around 3,000 acres of land. Um, they decided to live, they lived communally. So everything was in, in common. Um, they were issued their clothing and all their needs were taken care of. All their physical needs were taken care of. George Rapp was claiming to meet their spiritual needs. They um, were very industrious people. They had a reputation uh, for making excellent textiles. They produced cotton cloth, wool cloth, and also produced silk. And uh, these textiles were sold not only in their town of economy, but uh, sold throughout the United States and also some European countries as well. They did practice celibacy. And so as a result, uh, they're gonna die off in numbers. As far as some of the religious beliefs, George Rapp believed that Christ was gonna return in the year 1829. And they were going to accompany Christ to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and reign with Christ during the thousand year millennial reign. By 1905, there were hardly any harmonists left. And so the society was dissolved and there was a court case that was settled in 1916 in which the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania received about six acres of property with 17 buildings. And that was more or less the beginning of the Old Economy Village. So I wanna read um, a quote or a passage written by Duke Bernard of Saxe Weimar Eisenach, who visited Economy in 1826 and wrote about the gardens. And he writes, the garden, which encloses several acres of land and contains flowers and vegetables, and at the same time, a good vineyard, which rises in a semicircle to form in the form of terraces and ends in a bower. I especially admired the beautiful tulips of the garden. In the middle of the garden is a round basin with a wonderful fountain. Mr. Rapp there wants to build a temple on which a statue of harmony is to be placed. The statue was finished already. It is a colossal wooden figure by a sculptor in Philadelphia and resembles the figurehead of a ship. He goes on to write, in the garden are several small houses. One of them is covered with grass and has the shape of a pastry. On top is a fairly good sized seat on which in time music is to be played. The inside contains a hall presently still of wood. Beside the garden, a greenhouse was built. This house as well as the garden were under the supervision of a very beautiful girl whom I heard called Hildegard. She is a relative of Mr. Rapp and is said to know a good deal about botany. Okay, the next slide, Sarah. All right, so we're trying to figure out maybe what influenced George Rapp's garden. And this is a, a painting, Taurus Antonia, which um, is the 
is Princess Antonia's Tower. And this painting was done in 1660, depicting a garden with all sorts of religious symbolism in it. And this painting was located about 25 miles away from the town of Iptigen, Germany, which was the hometown of George Rapp. So we think it's very plausible that George Rapp would have seen and been familiar with this painting. And there are certain elements of uh, this garden depicted that George Rapp will use in his garden and economy. Next slide, Sarah. Here we have two different images of Central Park in Philadelphia. And that was located where Broad and Market Street intersect. Uh, the, the building was the waterworks. And in front of that is a statue that was carved by William Rush, the same artist who carved the Harmony statue that um, the Duke referred to. And uh, it, was, it was a fountain. So we don't know if George would have seen this or not. I actually think maybe this was produced after George Rapp came to the United States, but George Rapp's adopted son, Frederick Rapp, did a lot of traveling for the society and was in uh, Philadelphia um, several times. So maybe Frederick would have seen this and possibly um, decided to, to take some elements of this into the garden as well. Okay, Sarah, the next slide, please. Now, what's kind of funny, George Rapp had a frame house built early on. The, uh, the mansion, the brick mansion, wasn't started until 1825. However, George Rapp starts his garden in 1824. You know, that's how important the garden is to, to George Rapp. And there is uh, what we believe some symbolism involved with the garden. The main pathways of the garden are in the shape of a cross, which is a symbol of Christianity. And where they come together, there was a pond with water in, and water is a symbol of baptism. Now the harmonists believe not in infant baptism, but adult baptism. In 1827, the harmonists decided to add fish to their pond, and fish is a symbol of Christianity. Then around the pond, they planted trees called the Cedars of Lebanon. And uh, that is a tree that's referred to uh, in the Book of Psalms in the Bible. The um, garden is made up into four quadrangles. The northeast quadrangle was a vegetable garden. The southeast, there were fruit trees. The northwest was a vineyard. And an artificial hill was built up there. In fact, when they excavated uh, the cellar for the wine cellar on the, along the cobblestone street, they took that dirt and they, they built a hill from it and then planted the vineyard there. And with the, um, the grapes produced from the vineyard, they produced wine and wine is symbolic of the last supper. And then finally, the Southwest corner was to represent the wilderness. And there were, there were several different um, things involved here with, with symbolism. Next slide, Sarah. In the book of Revelation, in the 12th chapter, it talks about the sun woman. And um, it says, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon beneath her feet, in a crown of 12 stars on her head. George Rapp believed that the Harmony Society was the Sun Woman, referred to in the book of Revelation. And the, in the Bible, it talks about how the Sun Woman flees to the wilderness for a time, a times, and half a time. And so uh, George Rapp believed that when they fled Germany and came to the United States and settled in Western Pennsylvania and then Indiana, that that was all kind of wilderness 
type settings and that that was part of the, the prophecy of the sun woman. Okay, Sarah, the next slide. So then also in this wilderness was the grotto. And there were actually two grottos built within the town. The, uh, the one grotto outside of the formal garden had a labyrinth constructed around it. The grotto, the grotto was in the middle and it was symbolic of life's journey. Eventually this would be torn down. Um, there, were, uh, grot there were grottos and labyrinths in the first two towns of the Harmony Society, one in Harmony and then another in New Harmony. In 1811, there was a fellow named John Mellish who visited the Harmonists in Harmony, Pennsylvania. And he saw the grotto and he had this to, to say, the temple is rough on the exterior, showing that at a, distant, at a distance, it has no allurements. Next slide, Sarah. But then he continues to write, but it is smooth and beautiful within to show the beauty of harmony when once attained. We actually need to do some restoration work to the interior of our, of our grotto, but you can see two images there. Okay, Sarah, the next slide. Okay, so um, we have an image of the statue of harmony. The original harmony statue does not exist. By the 1890s, it was in bad shape and John Dust, who was one of the trustees, burned it. So our <laughs> reproduction is uh, based on a written description. So she was a, a woman strumming a lyra and she was a water fountain. So there was tubing that came up from the feet and exited through the fingertips. So streams of water would be coming from her fingertips at that Lyra. And uh, so it was, it was kind of a, a neat thing. It was, it was carved by William Rush of Philadelphia. It was finished by 1825. Mr. Baker, who was the storekeeper in town and who would then actually when George Rapp dies, in 1847 would become the head trustee, supposedly would take strangers to uh, the, the statue. And he would point to the statue and he would say to the husband, when your wife takes the high tone, you must take the low tone so that your notes may blend in harmony. On the right is a sketch by William um, rush. And it's a sketch dating back to around 1812 or 13 of um, called Columbia. Now, Ray Shepard, who had been um, a site administrator and historian here at Gold Economy Village, thought that there were some similarities between this image of Columbia and, and Harmony. If you look around her head, you will see stars but actually, in my personal opinion, I believe she's holding a flag because the stars actually kind of wrap down to her waist and it kind of looks like a, a canton of, of, the, um, uh, of the American flag with, with stars on it. But it's still kind of a very interesting image. Okay, Sarah, if you advance to the next slide. So in 1831, the pavilion was added. It was designed by Frederick Rapp, and we do have a drawing in the collection that shows a domed roof, but that was not, um, was not put on, it was, it was flat. The, uh, the finials at the top were carved by Pittsburgh artist Joseph Woodwell, and the orchestra could make their way to the top of that and perform. And so even though this was a formal garden for George and Frederick Rapp, it was a public space for the harmonists. Uh, they, could, they could enjoy the beauty of the flowers and, and a lot of concerts were held in the garden there. The original pavilion fell into disrepair and had to be 
uh, torn down. We do own some of the original pieces of the pavilion, but what you see now is a, is a reproduction. And the next slide, Sarah. All right, there were uh, various species in the garden. Uh, three that are shown in, in this particular slide are all symbolic. On, on the left, we have um, uh, lilies. And um, on the right bottom, we have lilies of the valley. And um, the one in the middle, I just learned about today, is called Love's, Love Lies Bleeding. And all three of these flowers oftentimes are symbolic of, of Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, that was, these were prominent flowers in the garden, but they enjoyed all sorts of flowers. Uh, we know from different sources that they had tulips, carnations, magnolias were grown there. Um, they grew figs in the garden. They, in the greenhouse, they grew orange and lemon trees. And other trees in the garden were peach, plum, pear, and cherry. And they even experimented with crops that you usually don't associate being grown in Pennsylvania. Uh, they, some visitors refer to tobacco and cotton being grown in the garden. All right, Sarah, next slide. And then uh, finally, we have the family gardens. Each harmonious household consisting of six to eight people had their own family garden that they would tend to. And they would plant herbs, vegetables, and flowers. In June of 1862, um, a Shaker elder named Giles Avery visited, and he actually recorded what he found in these family gardens. And so these harmonists were planting onions, beets, lettuce, carrots, potatoes, and cabbage. So we're grateful that um, Mr. Giles wrote that down for us. So that deals with some of the horticulture of the Harmony Society. Sarah now is going to present on the agriculture. Yeah, so um, David talked about a lot about um, George Rapp's um, garden behind his house. And I'd like to talk about the fields around um, economy. Economy and the other um, two towns that they established were very much set up like um, German towns from where they came from, where the, the village was all together and then people would go out to the fields um, to, to work the fields. And everyone went out to help with, um, with harvest um, so that they could bring the crops in as needed. But um, so the Harmony Society was an example of what was known in the 1820s, 30s as the American system. This was something that was promoted by Matthew Carey. Um, in 1819, he, he um, published a book called Addresses of the Philadelphia Society for the Promotion of National Industry. And so as part of this, um, the, the whole ideal was that you would place, like um, Thomas Jefferson said, you would place the manufacturer beside the agriculturalist. And that is how you would survive. As another part of that though, you would put commerce next to those two as well. And with those three together, you would have a successful form of production. Um, so the Harmony Society was really held up as, um, as a great example of this. Starting in New Harmony, in Harmony, Indiana, um, they, would, they started to be um, noticed as doing this very successfully. Of course, they were communal, um, so it wasn't quite the same as all the rest of America. Um, but anyways, in 1821, with um, the new olive branch, Matthew Carey actually um, used the Harmony Society as an example. So they wanted to place a tariff high enough on imported goods to protect and encourage American manufacture. So the Harmony Society did that a lot. So they were in touch with 
Matthew Carey, and also Henry Clay was um, a promoter of this, as well as um, other uh, other famous people. But even in um, the 1828 uh, presidential election, they were um, against Andrew Jackson because he wasn't supporting the American system. Um, one big thing that showed was in um, 1837, the Panic of 1837 happened and the Harmony Society was still in pretty good shape um, because they had this American system, the agriculture and the industry together, working together. Um, so I have um, something to read to you. This was um, written by Frederick Rapp in 1824. It is very desirable that the efforts of those patriotic members now in Congress should meet with success in their endeavors to lay heavy duties on all such foreign commodities, which could be manufactured in our own country if the undertakers were better supported by the government. Where else may the now languishing farmer look for a market with any certainty to sell his surplus products but to numerous and extensive manufacturing establishments within our own country. While the latter are forsaken, the farmer after toils and perils in quest of a market for the fruits of his industry arrived at his journey's end where the great influx from every direction has glutted the stores and warehouses with superabundance, has the misfortune of seeing his last hope vanishing and himself doomed to sacrifice his cargo and return home with an almost empty purse and broken heart to his needy and disappointed family. Such are the pictures we daily witness and regret that the means to better their condition is seemingly denied to them. May a wise policy govern in future our legislators to promote the welfare of the country. So another um, another example of um, of how the Harmony Society used their lands well was written by William Passavin, one of their friends, when he visited Economy in the spring of 1840. He said, "It is scarcely necessary to mention that Rapp's system is that of a community of goods, and that all members of the society work together for the common interest, by which the welfare of each individual is secured." The amount of land owned by the society amounts to 2,000 acres and without doubt is among the best on the Ohio. A large part of this is what might be called high river bottom land, which runs back to the hills and is in many places a mile in breadth. This part is all cleared and cultivated. While on the hills, there are yet large tracts of woodland. It is really a pleasure to walk over this immense plantation and see the perfection to which farming is carried. Some of the fields contain 50 or 100 acres and are surrounded by the best fences. And on their entire surface, not a stump is to be seen. If the land is too steep for the plow, it is covered with rows of white mulberry trees to supply the silkworms with leaves. If there is danger of a run washing away, its banks are lined with willows. Should the ground prove too marshy for the purposes of agriculture, it is planted with a species of osiers for the manufacture of baskets. In a deep ravine between sand hills, which would otherwise be of no value, has been chosen as the pleasure ground of their herd of hogs, where they may exercise their rooting propensities to their heart's desire without injury to the soil. In this manner, everything is arranged the different grains and plants are adapted to their appropriate soils. Everything receives a proper degree of attention and shows what can be done by a community of common interests properly governed. The number of farmers is very large and often in harvest, 50 reapers may be seen in a single field. The women who are not otherwise employed often work in the field during harvest and with their sleeves rolled up and a broad, broad brimmed bonnets on their heads present a very picturesque appearance. It must not be forgotten that they are always in a separate company by themselves, of course. Much attention is paid to the raising of fruit trees and in the fall of the year, every variety of apple, pear, plum, peach, quince, etc., may be had for the asking. 
Some of their orchards are very extensive, especially the apple, which covers several hills. The trees are grafted and produce ver every variety from the Rambo to the Juicy Pippin. From the inferior kinds, vast quantities of cider are made. The hardest kind of cider too. This is served out of out every day from a cellar to the families in proportion to their numbers. The flock of sheep belonging to the society is very large and numbers many thousands. They are pastured by shepherds during the summer who with their dogs lead a solitary life watching their flocks. So we have some examples and pictures of um, placing the um, industry and agriculture side by side. So up in the top left, we have the cotton factory and the grist mill with all these tree starters next to it. So they're growing big bunches of trees. This is another view of the grist mill and the cotton mill. And then there's the um, John Viert. He's the, um, uh, the operator of the flour mill and one of the hired workers. So there's also some Harmony um, bags in the collection. These are seed bags or grain bags from 1831 and 1862. And then in the next slide, we see their wool factory. And beside the wool factory, the wool factory sits just to the left of the bottom left picture. And there in the field is their um, bee yard the apiary, and also they're growing hops for their beer right next to that. And then on the right, you see the silk, some of the silk that they produced from their own silkworms and mulberry trees. And so they sold silk outside of the community as well as using it themselves. Other trades related to agriculture were uh, butchering, tanning, leatherworking, shoemaking, tailoring, cabinetry, clock making, and repair. So let's talk about, about harvest a little bit. Um, this picture in set in here is from 1924. These are people dressed as harmonists riding the hay wagon, which was very common during that time, um, during the harmonist time. So the Harmony Society grew wheat, rye, barley, oats, corn, beans, buckwheat, spelt, rape, clover, timothy, and they made hay from different grains as well. And they also um, grew all kinds of vegetables and fruit for their home consumption. They also made oil from flaxseed, walnuts, hickory nuts, and pumpkin seeds, and peach kernels. So they used this for different things, um, including lighting. So here's some pictures of some of the haymaking. Um, we love to show off the, hay, the haymakers. I don't know if I went too quickly, I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, um, you can see some of their cows down below next to an oil derrick. Um, so they're putting agriculture and industry together there. Up in the top left corner, that's their dairy. Um, and then their barns are on the right. The sheep that they raised were Saxony, Merino, Southdown, Bakewell, and Lincolnshire. Um, they also raised cows, pigs, oxen, and horses. So um, one little story that um, is fun to tell is about how the harmonists got their milk. They would all have their own um, cow um, in their sheds next to their house but some cows produced more than others. And so they, um, they would put whatever milk the cow um, produced for them into the top of the milk wagon. And then at the bottom, they would get out um, however much was their due um, according to how many people were in the society. Um, and sometimes you didn't get as much as your cow gave. So that was just how it was in a communal society. Um, harmonists made whiskey from their rye and corn. Um, that's a, one of the whiskey bottles down in the center middle or center bottom. Um, they made beer from hops 
grown at economy, and they made wine from the grapes that grew on the buildings and currants and other fruits. Um, they also made crab apple and apple cider. So in the upper left, you see the apple pickers. The bottom left is um, the people that are taking a break. They're taking their Vesperbrot, um, their time off from harvesting. Um, and then on the right, that's their cider mill where they also um, made their whiskey and then the laundry is back behind. And that's, that's the end. So if you have any questions, by all means, ask. We do have um, a question for you, Sarah and David, is that in addition to hard cider whiskey and wine, do you have documentation if the harmonists made mead? No, we don't have any documentation that I've ever seen. Okay, okay. And we do have one participant who um, thanks both, uh, both of you, Sarah and David, saying that they've been to two Shaker villages but did not know about the Harmonists. So uh, uh, we have illuminated someone. Uh, someone. Yeah, and the Shakers were friends with the Harmony Society. And um, a lot of people know about the Shakers, but not us, but come see us, definitely. Yeah. So it's fascinating to have um, Ephrata and Old Economy side by side. Their roots are both German Protestant, but uh, very different, uh, very different trajectories. Um, Michael talked about uh, flax. Do you know, were the harmonists uh, growing flax as well for their own textiles as well as for um, uh, sale? Um, we don't know a whole lot about their linen production, but we do know that they made linen from, you know, they grew flax and made their own linen, but um, their other um, textiles really overshadowed linen. And then with uh, the agricultural side that supports their textile industry, wool and silk, you mentioned cotton. Do you have the climate there to be able to grow cotton? No, everything was imported um, from the South. Okay. And then finally, um, Michael kind of provided a perspective with the agriculture and the horticulture directly um, providing for the, the needs of um, Ephrata in terms of their, their meals and such, as well as for sale, for income. What, what seems to be different with Old Economy is that so much of what they make goes directly to the market. Are they also growing these items at Old Economy uh, to directly support the, um, the, the food needs of the, uh, of the uh, community? Yeah, they're growing everything that they need. Um, the agricultural products of all kinds, the uh, meat, vegetables, they're growing everything themselves. And, and the harmonists ate more often than what the folks at Ephraim did. <laughs> the harmonists ate five times a day. They had, they had a breakfast, lunch, and supper, but they had like a mid-morning snack and then like a mid-afternoon snack as well. And I'll hazard to guess that the harmonists were not vegetarians? No. That's correct. <laughs> And then finally, as part of the compare and contrast with Ephrata um, being so connected to um, their printed work and their calligraphy and such that features um, flowers, uh, both fantastical and things that are recognized, do the harmonists have the same kind of traditions of calligraphy and printing as well that also features worldly and otherworldly um, plants? You don't see um, the calligraphy very much at all, if there is anything. It's, it's nothing like what's at Ephrata, but there are um, drawings that are inside books that you see that the harmonists themselves drew. So there's a lot of flowers in, that, in what, the, what they made. Um, recognizable or is what Michael was showing really fantastical or a combination of the, of the two? I think you would call it folk art. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but there uh, also, we didn't talk about the harmonist rose, 
Um, that was oh. basically their symbol. And um, the representation of it changes through their sites. Um, but there are some really nice drawings of roses, but they are um, more of the antique roses. Ah, uh, yes, very, the, the older hybrids are very different from the modern, the modern hybrids. Um, Michael, a question for you, is there documentation as to whether tobacco was grown um, in Ephrata? I see no evidence in the 18th century. Um, I can tell you that after the celibate members died in 1813, some married members came to live on the site. And so the land was farmed right up until the 1940s. And in some photographs we have from the 30s and 40s, there is tobacco being grown there at that point in time. Okay. But I should also say at that point in time, the town of Ephrata, which grew around the original settlement by the 1880s was a major cigar making area. At one point, there were more than 26 cigar factories within the town of Ephrata. Wow. But the tobacco grown in Lancaster County, even today, the Amish are known for the tobacco growing in Lancaster County today. Uh, Lancaster's tobacco is what is known as filler tobacco. It's not the big, broad, smooth leaves that are the wrapper tobacco, the nice last leaf on the outside of the cigar. It's the stuff in the middle. Wow, wow. Um, there's uh, a participant who's sharing that uh, her Pennsylvania ancestors were cigar makers. So thanks, thanks for that, Michael. Yeah. Um, and then two more questions, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up regarding um, the, the harmonists. Um, maybe it's because of the geography from, from New Harmony, but um, why did the harmonists end up in Western Pennsylvania versus the other parts of Pennsylvania, Southwest, uh, southeast that we so associate with German Pennsylvanians? Um, I know one reason that they settled, um, it was because it really reminded them of home. Um, I, we've had people that come and visit and um, have been to Württemberg around Iftigen, wherever they came from. And um, they say it's amazing how close it is. Um, other than that, I'm not sure. Yeah. Hmm. Um, someone makes a, 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 a comment that uh, the harmonists were known for their um, dyes and dyers and that uh, um, they're sharing that the harmonists dyed army uniforms. I've never heard that. Ah, <laughs> well, uh, for our participant Tara, if you're, if you, if you're willing to share with uh, Sarah and uh, David where that information comes from. I'm sure they would appreciate it. Um, I know that, that came from, uh, that came from when I was doing the research for the dyers film, the dye plant film. I read that someone wrote a famous dyer outside in Philly, I think. And they were asking questions because they were having a problem with one of the dyes for the uniforms. And the dyer wrote back, and I, the reference was from quite a long time ago, but it was the letter and the dyer wrote back, the expert wrote back, you, you needed to make it not so wet, or he gave them the instructions of how to fix the problem. Interesting. Do you know what era? Uh, no, I have to go back, way back. And I, I think I quoted it in the film because you know what we, we did the dye plants and then we did the color of the dye and then we had a quote in the film we had a quote from the reference to that dye mm -hmm. and so maybe in the film it tells the who wrote the letter and we could look back that way. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well. Uh... Sounds like there's a, a future conversation outside of this one. Yes. <laughs> and then finally, um, 
for uh, David and Sarah. The question is, are, are you aware of any books or publications that are available uh, that focus on the harmonious agricultural endeavors? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> that that's the problem. We we don't have a whole lot written about their agriculture. Um, so we really had to do some primary research on on this. And I guess the the same uh, probably Michael is true for yeah. Ephrata if there yeah, are absolutely. books um, uh, for the general public that that go into uh, farming, horticulture and gardening practices. The one source that I think is a really great source directly related to Ephrata does not come from the celibate community, but a series of letters written by one of the married members. His name was Dietrich Faunastock. And the Faunastock family um, is a genealogy book uh, printed in about 1942 or so. Um, and the, uh, there's a wonderful appendix to the book that has about a dozen letters that Dietrich wrote to his brother back in Germany, trying to convince him to come to live in Pennsylvania. And he gives some wonderful descriptions of his, his personal farm and what he was growing and the cattle he was raising and prices for things. He talks about building his house. And all. so it's a great references to many things of life in sort of mid-century uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. Okay. Well, for those of you that are joining us, if you have children, relatives, um, or family members that are looking for a master's thesis or a doctoral dissertation, I think we've got some brilliant, uh, brilliant subjects here. Um, well, with that, we're over time, uh, Michael, David, and Sarah, thank you so much. It was fascinating, again, to compare and contrast what we broadly look at Pennsylvania German spiritual communities and really delve even at the 5,000 foot level per se, seeing where there are similarities, where there are differences. And it certainly looks like that there's much more work to be done. For those of you um, online, all of our sites are now open on Fridays, Saturdays, um, and, and Sundays. Uh, we would love, love to see you. Um, at Landis in our agriculture um, exhibit, you can see examples of some of the types of machines and tools that may have been used at places like um, Old Economy and uh, and um, Ephrata. So we thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope that next year that we have our Urban Garden Fair live uh, and in, in, in person. And perhaps maybe uh, we can do something a little different, Sarah, David, and Michael, and have representatives of other German communities uh, sharing newly researched agriculture and horticultural uh, uh, traditions uh, to, to our live audience. So thank you so much for joining us. For those of you um, who are interested, we will have two more agricultural oriented presentations next week. On Tuesday, we'll be looking at um, the story of a well-preserved 18th and 19th century farm in Berks uh, County. And then on Thursday, we'll be doing a presentation on the founding and the growth of our heirloom seed uh, program and project. So thank you all for uh, coming again, Michael, David, and Sarah. Thank you so much for taking time out of your week and your evening. And hopefully we'll see you all at our sites. Thank you. And, thank you. Uh,